The following is the second podcast episode with my friend Alan Arslanagic, the founder and CEO of Visium, Switzerland's hottest startup. He has been selected by Forbes as one of the most successful young entrepreneurs in all of Europe, and he has been a great personal inspiration to me. This time we talk about Alan's crazy entrepreneurial journey, including all the ups and downs that he had before starting his current very successful startup. Visium is a cutting edge AI startup helping corporations make use of their data. Their team consists of some of the smartest AI and software engineers from EPFL and ETH Zurich, and they're currently actively hiring for technical and non-technical roles. Enjoy the conversation. You know, the very first <laughs> podcast that we recorded um, was, did, did you ever watch the movie 21? Uh, yes. So the movie 21 is like a bunch of MIT guys. Yeah, Blackjack stuff. Like Blackjack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the main person, I mean, this is a real real thing, right? The main guy who actually led the biggest team won like, I think, 5 million in total. Uh, he was my first guest on my podcast. And you know, I was all proud to have this guy and I'm famous, etc. And then we started recording that. And somehow we messed up. One of the cameras overheated. We didn't have this camera yet. Uh, and something, I think, with the audio didn't work properly. And then, you know, we, we lost that whole thing. Oh, uh, that, that was a bummer. <sighs> that was a real bummer. Yeah, it was, it was really sad. Anyways, man, how, how have you been? I haven't seen you in a long time. <laughs> yeah, good, good. When was last time? One year ago? Summer? Um, may have been. I stopped by... I think you visited Zurich in Your summer. Zurich office, yeah. 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 How's it going with the system? I was very curious. It's going very well. I'm actually not actively managing the company anymore. Um, it's going fine. It, it didn't grow as quickly maybe as we would have expected. I mean, maybe we were over optimistic when we thought that after two years we would have like 50, 60 people. Um, what are the areas of focus now of the services you provide? Is it's it's really digital marketing mostly. Okay. Yeah. We still work with How uh, come actually you specialize in that. Uh, the story is a bit embarrassing actually. So, I mean, we first started with just a personal assistant thing, yeah. and I thought that would be a good idea, but when you think about it, at the beginning of the pandemic, who actually needs a personal assistant to book, I don't know, trips, restaurants? Like nobody needs that, right? And then we were, I mean, I, I was a bit stupid at that time. I you know I'd hired five people already um, and we needed to pay their salaries, right? Yeah. But then I was like, shit, what are we going to do? We're going to go bankrupt. Uh, and well, then luckily, you know, for one person, I think it was, yeah, it was one company. I cannot name it. Um, He's, they asked me like, hey, we don't really need personal assistance, but do you do digital marketing? And I had no idea what digital marketing is. But you know, out of desperation, I just said, sure, sure, yeah, let's start in a month. And then after the call, I just quickly Googled what is digital marketing. I realized, oh, okay, so that's what it is. And then coincidentally, I had one person on the team who studied both that marketing. Mm -hmm. And she explained to me, okay, you have to hire, I don't know, web developers, graphic designers, X, Y, Z. And then we quickly started hiring all of these people. And then after one month, you know, we started working with that client, and from his perspective, everything was great, you know. That's really cool. Yeah, he wanted digital marketing. He got like a great team and everything. He didn't know that everything happened so spontaneously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, I can imagine. Yeah, that's the front stage and what goes in the backstage. Uh, yeah, you yeah. You want always to be. I mean, from my perspective in life, it gets harder and harder to be an entrepreneur because indeed you have, uh, you know, your lifestyle cost increases. So it's more difficult to take the sacrifice while you're a student. It's already like, like at the beginning, the entrepreneur is kind of like student lifestyle pretty much. Because yeah. like my first year uh, at Visium, uh, which was already my fourth or fifth company I launched, I still had one year without a salary. And so a friend of mine didn't need his apartment. I was living there uh, for rent free basically. And I had like, overall I was living with like 800 bucks per month in Switzerland, which I think it's almost That's impossible. Crazy, yeah. And so, um, you know, if you if you are in your 30s, uh, sure, you like your 40s or 50s, you can save money. But then there is another big factor, which is the responsibilities of your kids. And yeah. you don't take decisions anymore with your risk. You have maybe your wife that might not be um, as risk prone as you yeah, like yeah. risk taker, you know. And so sometimes you can just take the decisions to just what fits for you. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Are you often here in Lausanne or normally in Zurich? I'm mostly in Zurich right now. I spend about one to two days per week here. And I just typically come in the morning early and leave in the evening. And it's quite practical. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's convenient. The trains in yeah, Switzerland, yeah. you can just commute. Are, how many people are here and how many are in Zurich right now? 
I would say about 20 -ish here, 20 something, and maybe 15 in Zurich. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we have some other offices. Okay, so it's more and more here actually. Yeah, it's been uh, where it all started, and it's a bit the main office here. Oh really? So, I didn't. I didn't actually know that. Somehow I always thought you were the main office was in Zurich. No, no. Actually, we started here, and after a while, um, I guess two years in, I decided to move to Zurich, start the office there, expand it. So my co-founder and partners are here, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm there. Oh, that's so cool. I mean, it's, it's a crazy journey. We're going to touch upon everything with Visium in, in in a bit towards the end of the podcast, I suppose. Um, I'm really curious to actually hear like your whole entrepreneurial story because I know you didn't just start Visium immediately become successful there was a lot a lot more steps involved in all of this yeah um, absolutely how did you actually get the idea that you want to become an entrepreneur I was just thinking about that and and um, I remember when I was about 13 14 I would work during summers and very quickly I realized how frustrating it was for me to sometimes have a boss which wouldn't give necessarily wouldn't take the optimal decision and I would feel limited mm -hmm. and sometimes it would be frustrating or I would have idea I would like to implement to make uh, for example I worked at a um, boat uh, shipyard like a shipyard where they mm -hmm. repair boats they you know this kind of work I was working in restaurants and I remember very well I was at the restaurant and I was trying to you know help very proactively I was just like summer and I would my ideas would be shut down and that was a big moment of frustration and then um, I just thought, you know, I never wanted to have a limitation. And I think startups and entrepreneurship really gives you that. That's part of the of the reasons. The other part is just, you know, ambition and uh, and wanting to live life on my terms and wanting to make a big impact mm -hmm. and all of these things that kind of brought me to... You can surely make a bigger impact if you have your own company as opposed to just working somewhere, right? I think it connects well to the fact that the first reason which you feel limited in every company there is politics you don't decide always and even if you might want to make a massive impact there's so many steps and gates decision gates people that yeah. need to let you do it that at the end you might as well just do something like a startup which and there's so many other benefits to entrepreneurship which we'll probably talk about but you know in a startups the market like the sky is the limit if you yeah. if you're able to figure how to make a successful company you can scale it so much and you, you're the ultimate decision maker um, and so that's pretty cool as an entrepreneur um, so moving back to you know, your childhood so you were did you grow up in Switzerland or somewhere else yeah in Switzerland Southern from, Switzerland because based on your name um, your family is from is it Bosnia if I remember yes, correctly from Bosnia Sarajevo mm -hmm. we moved before I was born and um, both my parents are from Bosnia. Oh, cool! Do you speak uh, well Croatian Bosnian? Yes, yes, I do. I do. Oh, you do? Okay, that's. Look, I didn't actually know. I should have, should have asked. Well, we're not going to switch to Croatian now in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be a bit inconvenient. Also, it's a bit rusty. I probably have an insane accent and uh, make a few mistakes. But perhaps. still, yeah. Do you yeah. often still go there? I do. I'm gonna go uh, early August. I think I go once or once every one or two years, typically, just to visit my grandparents and, um, you know. Yeah, similar with me going to Germany. <laughs> My family is from there originally, yeah. even though I grew up in, in Croatia. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's I so know. cool. And okay, 13, 14 years, um, what was then the first real company that you started? So um, I started my first company, which comes back to what we were discussing earlier of just jumping into opportunities. It was, I was 19 years old, just turned 19. I didn't start my uh, bachelor yet uh, in business administration. And I decided to start a construction company, which does. <laughs> it's I mean, why not? <laughs> I mean, I remember it was frustrating because for most of my bachelor, whenever I would speak with some of my fellow students, oh, this is what I do, whatever, no one would believe me. It seemed like <laughs> just so in impossible. And they were like, who's this weirdo pretending he has a construction company? But it was true. <laughs> and it's a funny story. So basically, I, I used to work in a restaurant um, during summer. And I met um, uh, an Italian guy that moved to Switzerland um, and he was uh, working kind of in black in the restaurant. And during the day would, uh, like during the, the restaurant hours, he would be serving there. And for the rest of the day, he would do renovations mm -hmm. for the properties of the owner of the restaurant. And so it seemed very noble to me that he moved here, then he was trying to earn money, send it to his family and just wanted to help him. And I tried to get him a job and I got him a few interviews because my mom is an architect actually and so she could get him an interview 
it didn't work out. And for some context at the time, I was quite naive. Um, and so I just, I don't know if you, if you see what I mean, but um, we'll maybe get to it uh, through the discussion. It will, it will make sense why I mentioned it. But anyways, it didn't work out the job. And so I thought, okay, maybe we, I can actually start a company where you do your work and I'm applying the theoretical knowledge I'm learning at university. It's a good ground, you mm -hmm. know, playing ground for me to basically try to, you know, learn things. And I anyways knew it would take some time until it's successful. And my hope would be that by the end of university, this thing could pay me a salary and I could get started on the entrepreneurial journey. If you see what I mean, yeah, where, yeah. because there is a, a key step as an entrepreneur, like a milestone is when your company can actually pay your salary. And that's, you it's know, a big deal. it yeah. took a lot of years to, yeah. <laughs> to get there. And so, yeah, we were doing all sorts of work like paint, uh, painting, like, I don't know how to say, painting uh, walls, flooring, or like renovations, ceilings, so. all sorts of things, all sorts of works. It's been fun. So how many, how many, yeah, you said eight people at some point in that company, right? Yeah, up to eight people. And, uh, but with this person, I started the company with, it didn't work well. Um, a few, basically, many things but to cut it short it was like the works were not done properly it was taking cash and saying that the clients didn't pay and oh. um and yeah it was like a mess it was quite yeah. complicated and it didn't work so actually six months in i was left with actually it was maybe a bit more than six months in i think the company got incorporated in november so yeah six months in in may a few days before my exams of the first year I am with a construction company. We had like five, six, seven people uh, to manage and the main person that should, you know, run the show basically um, was out of the company and I was alone and, and it was crazy. And we had contracts in progress. We had leased a vehicle. We couldn't return. We had a few um, workers that we couldn't stop working with because we were getting some subsidies from the government mm -hmm. and we would need to repay them and we obviously didn't have that money you know it was but I mean great learning experience and we got out of it I mean I, I got myself out of it and found a new partner uh, that after about a year I sold him half of the business and after about two more years I sold him the whole business oh wow that's amazing so is it still running that's uh it just stopped running about a few months ago so it existed for 10 years and a few months ago it liquidated okay but it was still 10 years is yeah it's not bad yeah i mean any any company eventually goes bankrupt even if yeah. it's after 200 years yeah, yeah, uh, yeah so i mean 10 years is not the terrible lifespan and no, that's yeah. your first company right yeah that's pretty incredible um and then what, what was the next next adventure you went on so this one uh that was almax was um I was involved in it, I think, for three and a half years or so before I got completely out. And one year in, I started another one, which was about import and export of products. That lasted very shortly. It was only about six ah, months. Ah, cocktails. Exactly. And I wanted to do, like, that was an entry point, and I thought different products. So I had this idea. I mean, at the end, they're all pretty silly ideas. But when you, like, you learn so much by trying things out, that that's what gets you to the next stage, next yeah. stage. Better and so, than doing an MBA. Yeah, to some I mean, degree. <laughs> to some degree, for sure. Yeah, no. Cost uh, less than, yeah. <laughs> not sure about that. Okay, uh, it depends, it depends. <laughs> I did some, uh, yeah, still uh, did some very expensive mistakes. But anyways, <laughs> it happens. Uh, I'm in positive now, so that's, uh, I guess, what matters. Okay, that's, that's good. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, so the second one was import and export of products. Uh, as you said, we started with... Uh, some new brand of Sex on the Beach bottle, then we wanted to, we had the um, uh, import right and exclusive distribution right for Switzerland and Italy. The owner of the brand invested uh, quite a lot of money, 50 mi plus millions in marketing with all the celebrities. So we thought, okay, Ooh, this wow. could be the next cool thing. Um, we had the rights. And then they actually, in the first shipment they sent us, the quality of the product wasn't good. And uh, I, we needed to receive it. We set the inventory in our garage um in my friend's garage actually not mine and i wasn't there to receive the product so or maybe i just actually i, t I remember i just arrived the truck was waiting for me i went with the scooter from geneva to lausanne that day i got even stopped i think uh, by the police for some things i oh. whatever I, like uh, memories are popping uh, my mind right now 
So I accepted the shipment and I didn't know that basically if you don't check the quality, then the responsibility is on you. Like you cannot return it after once you sign, oh, you no. need to check. And there is this detail that cost me not too much because luckily the first order we reduced it quite a maximum. Was it like bottles or? Bottles, yeah. Ah, okay. Now and how, how much money did you lose then? It was, that order was about 5,000 euros. And that's still an expensive mistake. Yeah. I mean, how old were you back then? 20? Uh, probably 21 or, yeah. That's quite a lot of yeah, money, Yeah, it, right? it was a bummer, yeah, for yeah. sure. Did that cause the business like not to work at all or? So it did cause a lot of frustration actually. First, uh, I mean, I felt it was a bit of a, a strange move from the company, right? Mm -hmm. Like it didn't seem super correct. I don't know if they just want to get rid of the stock or what was going on exactly. So I just thought, you know, it's not the, the like it's not so meaningful. And I just kind of reconsidered, do I want to work in this industry? Because at the end it's like night, nightlife industry. All yeah. the people we were meeting and everything, it's kind of like a whole environment. And so it made me think better where I want to, you know, get involved in and what kind of work I want to do. Yeah. And for me, it wasn't necessarily that one so much. So, so it started and quickly and it ended quickly. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, the whole nightlife industry, be it for drinks, be it for clubs, it's, it's a particular type of people. Totally. I mean, I've met them, I, I don't know, I personally have a hard time working with them. You know, they're obviously very fun people for sure. Um, but they do think differently of it than, than, you know, me and like people I've surrounded with. Usually. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, it's still a good learning, learning experience. So you had uh, construction, then you had the distribution of, uh, of the cocktails. Uh, what was the next challenge you took on? Uh, the next one, which was, these were three things in parallel, more or less, actually. Or it was maybe just when we stopped the distribution one. Um, it, we decided to launch a social network or like a fundraising platform for charities. It was a bit of a mix of, you know, like typical crowdfunding fundraising yeah, platforms. Yeah. GoFundMe and yeah. social network. So we wanted to kind of do a LinkedIn of social impact where it would work with celebrities and celebrities like Roger Federer can make an account, uh, launch a campaign for any charity of his choice. And then everyone who donates can win prizes. And so there has been companies that have been very successful in this, uh, like Omaze, I think it's one. Oh yeah, I know them. Exactly. But in their case, it's not so scalable because every experience is in person and they need to run every campaign. They have grown a lot and they yeah, have like a massive space impact. Flight yeah. with uh, Virgin Galactic. Yeah. Or thing. spend a day with Arnold Schwarzenegger blowing up. Oh, I would love that. Yeah, of course. <laughs> that That's super thing. cool. Yeah. <laughs> we thought to do it more from a like fully automated way. So mm -hmm. celebrities could get an account if they sign in with Twitter and it's verified, they are approved immediately. They can launch a campaign directly. All of the money goes to their charity and uh, the fans mostly win video calls with them. They get called like through the app. Mm -hmm. So we were thinking to make something a bit like this. Um, that was a great experience. I just think the main learning there at the end, uh, and it was like a, also a long journey to two, two years plus more, more or less is that, you know, the underlying economics were very weak. So first we didn't have necessarily a clear, um, revenue model. So we didn't know if we take a, a small cut of the donations. What we went for is that we let people who donate decide if we want to, they add 10% on top. And so at the end of the day, it's very difficult to scale this. Like it's yeah. super difficult to get it started, to get it launched. Um, and yeah, at some point also I came towards the end of my master's and I needed to start paying a salary. You know, I wasn't getting any more uh, the student uh, support uh, that I would get from my parents while I was studying. So yeah, yeah. You were at that time already in London, right? Yeah. Yeah, because you were first at the University of Geneva mm -hmm. doing a Bachelor in Business. Mm -hmm. And you were briefly here at EPFL, actually. Yeah, I did one year here. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, for, for all the listeners, we're currently at EPFL in Switzerland. I think I haven't even said that <laughs> properly. Yeah. So you did one year here in computer science. Yeah. And that's because Elon Musk inspired me. And then I felt oh, like, I okay, see. actually... The tech world. You know, and also, I was a bit disappointed of my Bachelor because it was like, I didn't learn. Like, everything I learned is through up, like applying. Like, businesses, basically, I was learning yeah. much more while trying to build a business than the classes that they had. And I think many concepts in business are quite intuitive. So today, if I needed to give an advice to my kids, I would 
much rather tell them to study, you know, physics, math, computer science, or anything like that, which is not something that you can, you know, it's, you cannot learn intuitively. Yeah. You need to spend quite a lot of time to, <laughs> you yeah. know, learn yeah. and get good at, at it, as opposed to business where you can learn it like on the go somehow, if you see what I mean. Yeah, it's interesting. You got a lot of questions. So a lot of the audience members are actually like with a business background or very business minded. They always ask me, does it make sense to do bachelor in, in business? And then I, I mean, no offense, obviously, to anybody who, who studies business directly. I mean, obviously, <laughs> you're a good example of it working well. But I also do think like sometimes when you look at all the CEOs and founders of the biggest companies in the world, actually the broad majority of them are actually engineers. Yeah. We have Elon Musk and Bill Gates was an engineer. Was he an engineer? Yeah. Not Computer sure. science studied. Um, yeah, I mean, mo most of them. But Jeff Bezos as well, he studied. Well, he tried physics. He found it too difficult. And then he, he ended up doing something else, right? But yeah, it's just that mindset that you get of understanding, sorry, the technical know-how. And then you just learn. I mean, you can still do an MBA later, right? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I fully agree on that. I, I, I highly recommend, actually. Like, um, from my perspective and also what I will kind of try to pass as to my kids is more, you know, studying engineering is for me it's superior. Yeah, business is a mindset really. And coming back to just doing it, when I chose my studies, I didn't think too much. I thought, okay, I wanna be an entrepreneur, so probably need to start business. Yeah. That was, it's you like know, with insight at the time, right? I wasn't really, you know, thinking what are all the implications and how it would be. And so I came to FFL, I started computer science. I was running the businesses at the same time. And I wasn't used to consistently study throughout the semester to get good grades at the end. And so I didn't have the sort of discipline and uh, study habit to, to really succeed well in my, in my year. So I was a bit on the limit, mm -hmm. right, on, on passing or not passing. And at the end, and also I felt like I was a bit not super motivated to, of doing five years and I felt many of the things you learn at EPFL are very theoretical which can be good but not so applicable right like not so practical right away and so I just thought look I'm gonna try to learn by doing which is what I did I think I have um, I've learned uh, so much about machine learning which is currently like my, my my main occupation obviously I'm not the right the person that can tell you which algorithms or which models exactly it's best to implement but at the end a business needs much more than that and today luckily with my partners um, together we can rock it and we complement each other in in good ways yeah, we have a great team there mm -hmm. it's also very important oh that's so cool so you were at epfl for a year i can understand epfl is very hard actually there's so much to study i mean i was mm -hmm. here for two years well one and a half years then i went to harvard but i can say it, it was a lot of work and so many courses can be quite overwhelming yeah especially if you want to run, want to run a business on the side and um, well, yeah, then after finishing EPFL, you went to London, right? To, it was it Imperial? Yeah. Sorry, yeah, Imperial. Um, so I did a master in innovation, entrepreneurship and management. Um, and um, I expected more, uh, I must say. Hope, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I expected, you know, one of the best universities must be difficult because at the bachelor, like for me, it was quite easy. Like I didn't need to study too much. I could be... I could um, have very good grades and and I just thought, you know, I would be challenged, but at the end, you know, it's, I feel it's quite intuitive, most of the things and, yeah. yeah. I mean, for, for doing like anything entrepreneurship, business related, you kind of pay for the network, network when you do an MBA. I feel like yeah. most of the people that come to MIT to Sloan and do an MBA there, they kind of don't really care about their classes and then there are always these stories about them going to crazy parties in, in Mexico and then all the MIT, you know, typical like computer science people say, oh yeah, they don't only party, they don't study. But in the end of the day, that is what they really need to do. They go to parties with people and then they get a great network and then later they do business with these same people. Yeah. Uh, that's just something to consider always. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, I have a very, I would say, unique perspective because even when I was in London, I was not hanging out too much and going out. I was really spending a lot of time working and it's been like even in my bachelor I, I pretty much went five six weeks in three years to classes and and the rest of the time I was at home working on my businesses oh wow and when I would go to class I mean it, it's I would always struggle to focus in class because it I for me it's I tend to be fast paced I like to maybe speak fast talk fast think fast 
and I get frustrated, like typically how it's in, in class, like it's quite slow. And so I would get distracted. Yeah, I know the feeling. <laughs> and so at the end of the class, I would be, uh, okay, I have no clue what was, like what was even said. And so I would just study on the slides and things like this. And at the end, I ended up not going a lot to class. And so, and it was similar in Imperial. I, I think I went, I attended much more the classes, but still I didn't go out so much. And so all of this network part parties, which can be a great thing. Like I wouldn't say to someone, it's, it's a waste of time. Yeah, can absolutely. still be great, but as a as a good foundation, I would more suggest you know engineering first at least. I don't even know if an MBA is necessary. I think um, can be learned on the go, but yeah, can also help if you don't have the right people to start something. But True. you know, it's interesting with the classes. Uh, it was kind of a similar experience for me, except I think I made the mistake of actually going to every single class, sitting there looking out of the window. Uh, looking at the beautiful mountains here and then you know i wouldn't know anything and then two weeks before the exam i would just go through everything in a crazy pace because i always say diamonds are made under pressure yeah and i really cannot study unless there's a lot of pressure on me <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i think um most students uh know this feeling yeah even though in theory it is better to study regularly you remember more i mean i forgot most of the stuff that i learned uh, and especially in physics, it kind of matters to remember all these things. I mean, yeah. good thing I don't work in physics anymore because <laughs> I forgot most of the stuff that I learned. <laughs> Maybe the logic behind it is still yeah. something that I do understand, but I think that's something I learned in high school. Everything after that, uh, I've just been in decline in terms of like knowledge and understanding that. Um, yeah, I think this brings us to present day, sorry, to Visium. Or was there an com another company between these? Two other companies. Oh, wait, two more. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> list. How much time do we have? <laughs> no, anyways, I mean, let's keep it short. When I started Visium, I actually, we were working on an idea with Timon, uh, which is my co-founder and, uh, and, uh, and he leads uh, all of the engineering. Um, so when I started Visium, before starting Visium, we were working on another idea, which was a deep learning startup, but it didn't really go much more than starting to build, uh, let's say, a proof of concept. Mm -hmm. without really incorporation or company or anything and um, and we had this idea of it seems like most companies need these skills and no one has them and we have great networks so let's try to get started as a consulting company and it's also what would buy us the time it was consulting as we did it was you know this is a way we can have our own company start building something and then from there we try to identify maybe good product opportunity and do something even much more scalable and at that time we didn't we, we, you know, we needed to get a job anyways, and I needed to find, like, I needed to be sure that what I do would work, if you see what I mean, in yeah, a sense. Yeah. I was not a student anymore where I could just bet everything on Visium. I wanted to be sure that something works, and, and I started building on my entrepreneurial career mm -hmm. with something that works. And so, at the same time, probably with a one-month distance, we start, I started two companies. One was a real estate property development company which in this case, instead of doing the services, is the owner of the building. And then mm -hmm. mandates company, I actually worked a lot with the company I sold to do the renovations inside. And we can talk a bit how that came about. So you would invest and get built by building? I would get was... investors buy a building mm -hmm. and then renovate it and then either sell the apartments or, or rent them. And I, I thought this, is, this can just like, I can scale it well. I mean, just over time, you can, 20 years, you can build something massive in this area. Yeah, I mean, most of the really rich people are rich from real estate. <laughs> yeah. It is sad, but it is true. Yeah. And it's, it's not yeah. the most maybe exciting or intellectually stimulating or cutting edge thing, but you know, it was something for me to, to, to get uh, in that direction. And so Visium was high risk, high reward, and this was just more low it's a risk, medium reward. Yeah longer yeah. term I mean in the end of the day the kind of sad thing with real estate is um, in order to access it you don't need to be super brilliant actually you just need to you know the best thing is if you have access to a lot of capital from let's say your dad who does real estate and access to the right insider knowledge from let's say your dad who also does real estate then you have the best chances of actually staying in that business and building something huge yeah and you don't have to be I mean you have to be clever about how you do it mm -hmm. but it's not crazy difficult and this is actually Something that I've never said on camera, but now I can say it, why not? Um, actually, the main, my main source of income 
is definitely not from a system not getting money out of this it's also from something similar that i'm running i've never like announced it because i'm kind of running it in the background like a uh, apartment renting out um, furnishing them at harvard square renting them out to students there people love it because you know if uh, some mid-career mba person with you know decent amount of money comes there why would they bother you know connecting the internet buying furniture assembling the furniture it's like so much such a hassle and for some reason, most landlords are too lazy to rent out furnished apartments because I don't know, they have to deal with furniture. So they just don't do that. And they always have these unflexible 12 month contracts. Yeah. And I said, well, I can just rent something rent them and through a system, we'll see. Um, furnish it nicely. No, it doesn't even have to be expensive. You do the same thing for every apartment, copy paste. People love it. They just move in with their furniture. Yeah. They're happy to pay a big premium. And that's like mm -hmm. kind of my way. This is interesting. I mean, the assist is the thing that I always talk about. But actually, I never like earned money from a system. I earned money from like renting out apartments. And I think, like as you say, real estate, uh, all, like you don't need to be super bright. But in general, every, it's accessible for everyone. People might think, okay, there is no way. I don't have any capital to start. I um, I don't have knowledge of the industry. I don't have connections to find leads. Mm -hmm. At the end, it's what you focus on. Like either you focus on your limitation and you set yourself that you cannot do it, or you focus on how to make it happen. And so many people can start from nothing and be able to do it. At the end of the day, in my case, I convinced an external investor, which is someone I knew and I had the capital. Um, and you just like for it to work, you just need the person to trust you that there is a good opportunity that is going to return in good capital and almost anyone can do it. And so at the end I had two investors and the deal was we split 30, 30, 30, like uh, one third each, mm -hmm. the, the profits of the company. Then one investor um, at some point left and we were uh, actually just two and so I could, uh, I could take uh, the profits and, uh, and that's how I started because I didn't have any starting capital myself. So this is very interesting. I mean, a lot of people watching this are now really thinking, okay, how can I start a real estate company? I mean, okay, that's a good point. If you don't have the, first of all, getting a loan is a hard thing. If you can get some money, you know, 20% down payment, you might be able to get a personal loan and just buy a property and do whatever with it. But what, what if you don't have that? How do you convince someone? I got the loan. So first some banks and even the ones we knew personally didn't even want to listen it. They were thinking like, I was quite surprised and I was also quite annoyed um, that the, the, the building project I did was in Bellinzona and this bank in Bellinzona that works already with my family and like my mother specifically and, and her company, he, he didn't even want to meet or listen to the project and, and I just thought, you know, I, I didn't expect it, let's, let's put it that way and at the end I, I just called different banks. Uh, and most were skeptical and I think it's because you have this 25-year-old uh, uh, at the time I think it was 25 or 24 and I thought you know it's just out of their realm of possibility that some 25-year-old person can renovate a building yeah and so many didn't want to listen and one in this case was Credit Suisse decided to listen and get a loan they didn't have any previous connection with them and they gave a loan without any personal guarantee of anyone we just had the um, property I I think we put even like around 20% of the capital which came from the investors and then it was a business plan, a project and you know in real estate it's about having the down payment. Mm -hmm. We were able yeah. to get even less than, than 20% quite a bit with some ways that you can... Um, so but it's interesting so you're saying even though you had enough money to make a down payment the bank still wouldn't give you a loan? No they wouldn't listen they wouldn't even they would they would it's not even just rejecting the loan mm -hmm. it was just that for me it seemed for them it's impossible like it seemed you know what do you see what i'm not sure if i'm clear here I but mean, it's I just that the, it's the banker's mindset i mean i feel they wouldn't want yeah. to consider it and i was surprised because at the end you know you have the house as a collateral what's the matter i felt it might be a subjective wrong perception but i felt sort of discriminated by my age if you see what i mean yeah yeah that just because i'm young you don't want to, you know, take this seriously. That makes sense. It's very, it's very sad that this does happen. Um, but yeah, and also I think it's sometimes a banker's mindset, and I think it's worse actually in the U.S. Interestingly than here. Um, you know, their number one objective is I don't want to get fired. I don't want to be the one who approved the loan to a 24-year-old and who then messed up. Yeah. You know, like why would I take that risk? I mean, even if it works out, you know, the upside for the banker is like not very high. 
unfortunately they don't give rewards. I think in the US it's even more rigid. I mean you have credit scores. Yeah. Um, and you know, the banker it's not even that it's not even that they don't want to listen. They they don't decide anything. They just put the numbers in a in a computer. Um, unless you have some big connections there. Uh, they put the numbers in the computer and the computer says or <laughs> and you know if you're if you're especially just moved to the US like me, it's it's always this, right? Yeah. Um, but it's fascinating that he managed to convince Credit Suisse, which is you know, not, not some small bank that he would expect to be more flexible. It's like a really serious big bank to, to give you money for that. So yeah. how, how did this whole real estate work? Uh, it worked quite well, actually. It was the first entrepreneurial project where I made a good chunk of money, let's say. And it worked quite well at the very end. But in the middle, oh my God, it was a mess. Like so many things happened that it was crazy. And because Visium turned out to work well quite quickly and you know I became to be quite absorbed and there was lots of work to do. I ended up working on the real estate on the weekends and working on Visium during the week and a bit the weekends and so it's been quite intense for some time. But anyways, so um, we bought a three-story building with five apartments and um, some of the issues Long story short, the budget we we spent we ended up spending almost two and a half times what we planned for the renovation, which is massive. Yeah. Um, so we need to find some kind of I don't know backflip solution, you know, like last minute things. This happens a lot in entre in entrepreneurship, and it's a cool thing because you get facing a very difficult situation so many times. Like even with Almax, which was my first company, you're just a young person with, let's say, like, like just a normal guy, let's say, and you are in a situation, oh, okay, I need to, f to have 20,000 by the end of the month to pay the bills. When you are yeah. like a student, maybe, you know, like, it's, it's astronomically high, these right? These situations happen a lot uh, in entrepreneurship, I think, and you, at the end, you learn, you, you always find a solution. And I always found a solution to, to get out. It happened. Same happened with this project. Like I knew I had bills like 30, 40,000 by the end of the month. I had no solution to anything. You think you find something and it works. We ended up uh, splitting one part of the land, selling it to the neighbor. We ended up raising the roof of the house and creating a new like uh, floor, let's say, and, and get additional living profit. space yeah, from yeah, our profit. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, similar to my story with Assisto and the digital marketing, I mean, I was really just in a situation where, and nobody knew that in the company at that point, that we just thought we, in the end of the month, we will not be able to pay salaries to people who have families or everything. And it just, at that moment, you just suddenly, as if your IQ tripled all of a sudden, you can just think of everything. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly you see the solutions everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and it's, it's when you're really <laughs> challenged like that, that you, you know, improve and step yeah. up your game and increase your uh, area of type of problems you can solve. So um, it's very cool. Amazing. So you said there were two companies uh, in between London and... There was another one yeah. which uh, which I, I supported recently and I invested part of my um, gains of the real estate one, mm -hmm. uh, which happened, uh, it was started I think early 2020. So it's been already quite a while into Visium. Visium was already quite relatively big, 20 people or so. Uh, and I just, I mostly like supported this company. I, I made an initial investment and then I supported uh, them over the weekends, you know, with some coaching and things like this. And it was um, a sustainable uh, fashion e-commerce platform, just, you know, trying to f simplify to people, um, going in one place, finding great design uh, clothing, but that they are of the brands that are most uh, steered towards, you know, sustainable uh, mm -hmm. uh, practices. And this was uh, some, did you co-found the company or? Um, I didn't co-found it per se. I did like from a legal perspective, yes, I, I was the first that started the company because there were some yeah, like yeah. permits, things and things like this, but I wasn't a co-founder in terms of, you know, my implication. And you already had a lot it of depends. stuff happening. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Two other big businesses. Yeah. Which actually brings us to the main thing that I wanted to talk about, the Visium. I mean, we've mentioning, been mentioning it all the time. So how did you even have the initial idea to start Visium? So... <laughs> This is a funny one. Um, yeah, I mean, we were just noticing that people around us just finishing studies were getting insane offers. Okay, come and be the 
head of AI at this big bank and for insane salaries and everything. And we thought, okay, why? Like there is really a need here yeah. for this type of skills and 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 no one no one really has these uh, capabilities, you know, in all of these enterprises. And so we thought, yeah, perhaps we can, you know, we have great talents here in EPFL. We can maybe set up a structure very similar to, to what you did with Assisto. And we could try to support these companies, build solutions. At the same time, we get ideas and we could do a product after, you know, like build a, a software and sell it as a, on a licensing model. And so we started it and um, quite quickly we got some cool projects. We had a bit of a strategy starting first with small companies, get a track record so you have credibility then go to enterprise clients so you inc get much bigger revenues because you know if you do pricing optimization for a company of 100 million revenue or one for 1 billion revenue you can Big do difference. 10x the business impact yeah. and so we wanted to work with bigger companies and then from there once we are set well financially and we have got very solid and revenues and profitability we could then focus on building IP and building solutions that we can scale and so um, what was crazy about it is that only a few months in, and we we incorporated the company first as a SNC. I don't know if you know what it's. As a, it's as like a, not even, even, not even. Okay. It's like you have four legal entities in 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 Switzerland. You have the S GmbH SRL, yeah, Société à Responsabilité Limitée, the Société Anonyme, which is the biggest oh, one and most serious one. Yeah. Most biggest big companies are are in this form, and then you have the individual company which is pretty much, I don't know. Oh, I know what it is actually. Yeah. You have the individual company and you have the collective company. And those two legal forms don't give you any protection in terms of liabilities. And it's kind of, it's not, it, it's not so common. It's maybe, it, let's say it's less serious, so to say, than, yeah. than, a, than a incorporation, which is this Societe Anonyme. And so even with that legal entity, we were able to sign a contract with a major enterprise of like 10,000, plus employee and you know 10 billion plus revenues in a very short time and it was a game changer for me because I didn't expect at all that we could work with such companies because typically they want to work with companies that are 10 years in the market Argue, and so, a lot of capital and so that was a good uh, proof of the of the need of what we do and um, and it scaled from there and you know the second year we were already making uh, two and a half millions in revenue. So it went quite quickly and it was really exciting. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. Uh, probably the main challenge for you was finding the software engineers and the well, scientists in general, um, because I think that is really the competitive edge that one needs to get. And there's like really hard because all these people get huge offers from Google, Microsoft and all these big companies. How do you as a small startup get people who are like that level brilliant? I mean, a uh, few things here, uh, but I might, it might be surprising because I think it's the, it's really not a problem for us. And it, it's not a problem because we are one of the very few companies that's actually doing cutting edge ML. So the stuff that you're learning in your masters or, or bachelor, it's, it's what you end up doing at Visium, which is almost never the case in the industry. Yeah. And that's one reason. And then obviously having great um, partners and co-founder Timon and Matteo. And Timon brought uh, an in a good initial team and then it became a reinforcing. You know, we have, I think at EPFL we have a very good reputation in terms of like from the technical perspective of what we do. And we never have difficulty hiring in amazing engineers. Like that's that's impressive it's really cool the only and on the other hand where we struggle is to hire business talent because we needed to reinvent the the way we recruit uh, whereas for machine learning Visium brand is known engineers tend to proactively look if there are opportunities etc and we can just post opportunities and we get good application on the business side business people don't understand why we're different than any other company like mm -hmm. they they there is not this uh, understanding about uh, what's the opportunity, how we're special. And so it took us quite a bit of time to build a talent acquisition practice that works, that is outbound, that we are reaching out us to the talents, finding them. All of these things took, took, uh, took a bit of time. And also it's much easier to get hires right in engineering because it's easier to assess the skills than in business. True. In business is a bit more 
subjective difficult yeah you also need to and recruiting is not super intuitive and the recruiting process and the best practices it takes time to learn and you need to be really good right like to to not make it a gut feeling decision and many times be wrong due to whatever biases and you didn't cover the important things yeah you know. yeah um but i'm also curious so actually we, since we have a lot of people listening with i think probably half of the people are you know tech background well, the other half again i shouldn't say half and half but let's say 40 percent tech <laughs> background 40 percent are very much in business and startup with background are there any open roles that you're currently what about the other hiring? 20 uh, they're like <laughs> I, I don't know <laughs> you can let us know in the comment section <laughs> um many many different backgrounds i suppose um but yeah are, are there currently any open positions that you're so that you maybe hire? before we jump on the open position i'll just give a quick overview of what we do that's a great idea i forgot <laughs> to say <laughs> that <laughs> Um, so at Vision, what we do is we help uh, companies implement successful AI and data initiatives. So transform the company, like leverage data as an asset, identify opportunities, and build solutions. And a few examples that we might get into more details later or not is um, we help uh, a chemical company generate chemical formulas that then turn into product thanks to AI. Uh, we help uh, pharma companies streamline clinical trials by doing automated lesion detection. Um, we help uh, uh, companies like Nestlé uh, do predictive maintenance and machine analytics based on sound. And so teaching a model to know when the production line is working and when it's not working. This is many varied uh, across, you know, all types of data, etc. And so, so that's... Yeah, pretty much engineer, AI engineering services. Really the cutting edge of what AI yeah. currently does. Yeah, definitely. And um, so the type of roles that we have, because we also have a, a kind of product uh, venture building division where we try to, some of the solutions, we try to productize them and, and scale them. The type of roles that we have at Visium are from machine learning engineering, um, software engineering, data engineering, AI project management, um, product roles, so product owner or you know this this product manager, etc. Uh, business analyst, sales roles, business development roles, marketing roles, and uh, then obviously finance people, recruitment. So there is a bit of everything, and there is all the time positions. There is always we're always recruiting more than we have online, so it's great if. People want to just shoot an, a spontaneous application to not hesitate. Okay, we'll and put the uh, information in the link down below. I mean, it's not, yeah, and not even just about Visium is that if there is a company you would love to join, they probably have a need for position and they didn't have time to post it. And if you call proactively, you might actually end up getting your opportunity. So I would tend to suggest that for, for people. Yeah. Because it takes so much time. You need to organize who's going to prepare the job description, the process, launch the campaign, and so if you're in touch with someone at the at your dream company and you try to you know keep a relationship it might help yeah and there's this rule that 80 percent of the positions are not advertised online yeah but only 20 percent kind of apply by reaching out to them yeah, yeah. so you want to be the 20 percent that reach out to the 80 percent as opposed to being 80 percent of the people applying to the small fraction of jobs that are not online that are yeah. online sorry yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, re I really hope that uh, you're gonna get some good applications and potentially even some future hires in, in, in your company. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you would like to hear the second part of our conversation, where we talk about happiness, self-improvement, and how entrepreneurs change the world, you can check it out now. Also, if you would like to reach out to Alan personally and talk to him, you can do so directly on Instagram. Thank you so much for listening. Take care and goodbye.